Hello, welcome. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace, and we are beaming in from the studios of Radio Free, Free Asia here in Dharamsala in the beautiful mountains of northern India. And thank you for joining us for an important conversation that we'll be having on finding resilience in the face of conflict and crisis. The U.S. Institute of Peace was founded 35 years ago by the U.S. Congress uh, with the mission of preventing and resolving violent conflict around the world. And we do this uh, by working in regions affected by violent conflict, partnering with people, with organizations and governments to share knowledge, tools, and information about how to prevent conflict from becoming violent and how to resolve it if it does. Um, we know that some of the most violent conflict in the world is occurring in countries with the youngest populations. For example, in both Nigeria and Iraq, some 40% of the population is under the age of 14. So we know that it is the youth in those countries who are the best hope for a more peaceful, more prosperous future. Um, so we are here in Dharamsala where we have just completed a dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama with USIP's Generation Change Fellows. And Generation Change Fellows uh, are a network uh, that USIP supports with training for them to become uh, more effective leaders and very importantly creating a community of practice so they can support each other in their important work, sharing information, sharing ideas. And this week, 27 Generation Change Fellows joined thought leaders for a dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama on what does it take to maintain the kind of inner resilience and resolve to be a peace builder in very difficult conflict situations. And I can tell you that after having been a part of that dialogue, I am coming away filled with enormous hope at the determination, at the creativity, um, at the dedication of these young leaders. At U.S. Institute of Peace, our motto is that peace is possible, and we're certainly seeing that here in this conversation. Um, we have a great panel conversation, and then we're going to engage all of our Generation Change Fellows. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank Radio Free Asia uh, for three years now of collaborating on this important program. Uh, I'd also like to thank GHR Foundation, uh, a wonderful partner who shares with U.S. Institute of Peace a, uh, a sense of importance and dedication to supporting youth leaders in their efforts to build bridges around the world. Um, and with that, I'd like to to turn it over to our moderator for uh, today's discussion, Greg Zoroya. Greg is a writer uh, on the editorial page of USA Today. He's also <coughs> covered uh, conflict in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and he's uh, received awards for his reporting on the impact of conflict uh, and the trauma that it causes on both individuals and those who are serving in those areas. So he's well positioned uh, to take us through an important conversation with wonderful panelists. And with that, I turn it over to Greg. Greg? Thanks, Nancy. I appreciate that. This is such an exciting uh, time right now and, 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 and such an exciting event that we're involved in here because we have these youth leaders that are at the forefront of trying to do amazing things in areas that are so dangerous and so full of conflict. Um, our panel discussion tonight is as both uh, uh, people who are youth leaders doing this kind of work and also subject matter experts. And I'd like to introduce them to you. To my far left is Jimmy Briggs. Jimmy's a journalist and activist. He's a documentary storyteller, writer, and, and advocate for racial and gender equality. A member of the, he's a member of the New York City Mayor's Gender Equity Commission. He's also an adjunct professor at the International Center of Photography in New York. He was the founding executive director of Man Up Campaign, a globally focused organization to activate youth to stop violence against women and girls. To my immediate left is Maya Sotero. 
Maya serves as a consultant to the Obama Foundation. She works closely with their international team to develop programming in the Asia-Pacific region. Before that, uh, she was the director of the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where in addition to leading outreach and development initiatives, she also taught leadership for social change, history of peace movements, peace education, and conflict management for educators. To my right, to my immediate right, is one of our two youth leaders, uh, Wadi Ben Herky. Uh, her passion is equality for all. Uh, she works with uh, training people uh, as human rights experts, and she supports, uh, and, so, and this is in support of women's rights. And to her right uh, is Marone Kocho. He works with young people in northern Iraq. Marone was born in a Yazidi family in a small town of Bashika that is located north of Mosul. Uh, he works through an organization called Middle East Sustainable Peace in helping to shape peace activists. So the, the crucial issue right now is in, in the idea of resiliency and conflict is how when a conflict occurs, resiliency is so important. And in discussions with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama this week, um, we learned about uh, ways to try and deal with resiliency. Wadi was there, and she was asking uh, him questions, as were other of these youth leaders. She told an incredible story about uh, something that happened to her just recently uh, from in Nigeria, where she's from, where there can be random violence. In that case, recently she lost her uncle and I wondered if she could talk a little bit about that, because in the question she asked the Dalai Lama, she said that uh, um, this, this kind of uh, conflict, this kind of terrible thing that happens to her, these kinds of things happen so often that now she's almost finding it hard to, uh, difficult to cry. Wadi, could you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe a little bit about what the Dalai Lama had to say in response? Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it was a great pleasure meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And my question was basically where I am at this point, where I, like I said, I, was, I found it difficult crying because it's like normal. I cannot count how many relatives I've lost. And so it's just like, it's nothing new anymore. But one thing he told me that I will go back home with is the fact that you should either use the pain for something good or bad. Either use it to, for, to determine to end this violence or use it to just sit down and say, if I'm safe, I don't care about other people. And in Nigeria, most people, because of the pain they've gone through, they start to join the terrorists. They're like, I've been hurt, let me hurt other people. But one thing I realized is that it's going to be a vicious unending cycle because I will hurt you, you will hurt her, you, and it will not end. But when we decide to sit back and absorb the pain and translate it into something amazing by saying, although I was affected, I don't want another person to be affected, you use that pain and push it to strengthen you to end that cause, either by starting up a movement or by just doing something, <coughs> amplifying your voice, basically. And that's what he said. He's been through a whole lot, but he did not let that um, limit him. He instead used that to keep spreading love, peace, and which I believe is possible. Although now I find it difficult crying, but it doesn't mean that I will stop. I still believe I can do something, and I will definitely try my best. So at the end of the day, I will know that I played a part. A lot of what he had to talk about was about inner peace. What does that, what does that mean to you? And, and, and is that something that, that you feel like you can really try to acquire? Of course. Inner peace is something that I don't think anyone can take away from you because it's within you. It's not like a book or a clue that someone can take. And that's something I believe we should learn to keep sacred and not let just anyone influence you. There was something profound he said today where he was like, you know that someone is really at peace when you look for the person's trouble and see how the person reacts. Most times we're peace builders, we go, we say, let's stop this war, do this. But at the end of the day, we go back home and we feel so much pain, so much pressure. And he said, when you respond to criticisms, you're not at peace. Because when you believe so much in yourself and the motive behind what you do, Whatever people say wouldn't really matter to you. So inner peace is something I take, I would take very seriously, especially looking at his life. 
if he didn't have that, I don't think he would still be alive at that age and still have time to talk to us. So inner peace is what you will use. And then when you have it, you can easily give it out. So inner peace is something I've learned from him and I'll take it back home. So I'll be able to live long enough to make the change I want to see. I know that a lot of working with working in areas of conflict it deals with, uh, you have to deal with migration, with uh, people who are, who are driven out of their homes. Marone, I know that you've got firsthand experience with that. Uh, ISIS came to your, your, your area where you lived, north of Mosul, and, and people were just fleeing from them, uh, those that survived. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience and, and uh, in trying to work with people who are, who are caught up in, as refugees and in, in, in migration. Um, you have to kind of work with what, how, they, how they react to this situation, how it changes them and changes their lives. What you've actually gone through that yourself. Can you talk a little bit about how you reacted? Yeah. <clears throat> in the beginning, when we started fleeing to the, safe, the safe, safest areas, north of uh, Iraq, to Kurdistan specifically, we had faced like so many problems, like seeing so many people living in the streets without shelter in the beginning, especially in the beginning before the NGOs and the Kurdish government started to help uh, the refugees. We faced so many like challenges to accept the hate that it was inside us against the ISIS. We had most of the people were facing were facing that losing the, the, the faith in humanity, losing the faith in all the neighbors. Because most of our neighbors of that town like were the ones who were against us. But we had to come up with a solution. We had to absorb happiness, absorb peace and uh, just get off the hate inside us. That was difficult, and for me it was, it was really difficult and challenging for me. But for other people, it was, they, could, they cannot accept it. This being displaced is not just living in another place. We would appreciate if we lose our places forever, but not losing a woman, and being used as a, sex slave, or being <coughs> sold, or children being uh, trained to be soldiers and terrorists. But it's our right and it's our goal to start and build up the happiness and build up peace in ourselves to bring up our community back up again. It can be, a, I'm sure, a kind of a dizzying try to, effort to try and understand how to deal with being forced into a whole different country or a different part of the country you're in and losing your homeland. I remember that the youth leaders, when they were talking to Dalai Lama, brought that up. And his answer was about looking at this kind of oneness and, and, and looking at your, trying to understand that, you know, you, you can't be tied to so, so much to where you're from. Can you, I mean, did that make sense to you? And what, what did you take away from that? It does make so much sense to me. And uh, in the beginning, it was hard. It was really hard to accept the difference, the new environment. But as he mentioned, and I remembered when he, ma when he his holiness talked about it, that oneness and living in a, in a new place, and you see other people, you don't see a difference. And you should accept it, because all the humans are the same, and the land is changing, and the borders were made by politics, by politicians. And it was made, like in the beginning, it was made for all the people. Uh, again, for most of the people who fled and were displaced, they got used to it, to leave, and they, were accept they accepted the new environment, they accepted the new people. They started doing business sometimes, some of them, but again, the most important thing was, were the women who were taken and sold. And most of the other uh, men, like 7,000 men, uh, women, and children were, were used to be sex enslaved. And the children, again, were, so, were trained to be soldiers. But the men were killed 
So most of the families lost their people. But again, the ones who made it and managed to escape and they got used to live in the a new environment. That's a, it's a really hard lesson to learn. Now I want to open this up to uh, members of the audience. So we've got a wonderful selection of youth leaders in the audience who have their own experiences who come from areas of conflict. Um, we've got subject matters up here that uh, subject matter experts up here. We, you could ask questions of other members of the of the youth leaders. Before we begin, though, I'd, I'd like to throw out a question to the audience, and I'd like to hear from a couple of you about what you think about this. I know that when you came here uh, to see the His Holiness the Dalai Lama, many of you had questions about, you know, how how do how do we succeed against um, the strife that we're trying to deal with? I mean, some of it, as you explained, many of you so eloquently, is so difficult and so prevalent that you work so hard to help to try to bring peace and try to uh, resolve issues that it seems like it's it's impossible to see change and when many of you asked him about that he said something interesting um, he said we should be determined to make an effort uh, but without much expect expectation of change it was kind of a very realistic way of looking at it almost like a like a, a cup of cold water in the face and I'm curious can one of you just tell me, did, that, did you find that sustaining, or how did you, how did you respond to that? Anybody, if you, if you want, just raise your hand. And, and uh, yes, please, and give us your name and, and what country you're from. Um, hi, uh, my name is Dua. I'm from Iraq. And um, what was important about His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is that he was um, so spiritual and realistic, and we can relate to him. Uh, he said that we may exhaust ourselves as like human rights fighters and like peace builders. Sometimes we reach this point of frustration and like we, we can we can do it. I mean, we sometimes um, reach this point of depression that uh, our, our efforts are not enough and like we, we didn't make any change in our society. But he said that, okay, you don't have to expect anything to change in the near future, maybe in the next 20 or 30 years. So it's like a planting a seed and having the, the passion and um, uh, uh, and patience to uh, like to wait it to like be a tree and uh, to have like better results in the future. So being realistic and at the same time having this insist insistence in inside our souls to make an effort. It's like um, being um, like it, it, it uh, lifts some of the weight that we have on ourselves, like mm -hmm. as peace builders, and at the same time, we can like continue like our efforts. He said himself. I remember him saying that he doesn't believe he would see change in his lifetime. Um, and I know you, you are young people with many years ahead of you. Um, I mean, do you? Do any of you think? Are you settled now that, with this idea, this notion that? It's that patience is what's going to be important, and that it's going to take a long time. Anybody? Yes, please. Greg. Oh, yes. Go right ahead. Give uh, us your name and, and your country of origin. Hi. I'm Mohammed from uh, Somalia. Um, I really learned a lot of things from that uh, point of view, especially uh, the point which was related about uh, resistance and efforts, because uh, that was one of the major uh, problems that I have been facing with uh, the projects and also uh, things that I have been doing because of uh, when I started my work. Uh, could, you, could you stand up, please? Thank you. And start over. Um, that was a message that I got from His Holiness Dalai Lama. Uh, it was because uh, when I started some of my projects, one of the things that I had in my mind was like uh, the outcome. So I was expecting the outcome to come uh, and they get very soon. But um, from his speech, I got that we should not expect the outcome, but we should pay a lot of efforts in being committed to what we are doing. So which makes us even get the outcome. So if we always keep in mind the outcome and to get like uh, the great work which is related to peace building, that we get the peace and we live in peace, then it might not come. And the, the greatest example that he gave just helped me a lot, which was like uh, that he has been working for peace for more than six years, and he still 
you know, in thrust of just like getting, but he's not expecting even to get, but just doing that for the other generation. So this gave me like a very great uh, inspiration, which is like, you know, that I do whatever I do, and uh, we move my mind, you know, to bring like, you know, why, what do you get from this thing? Just that, I uh, just give any effort that I can to at least even give others the outcome of what I'm doing. That's Thank a, you so much. An incredibly generous way to look at it, and especially when you consider the, the great strain that must, that must come from working in areas where there's such conflict and it's so difficult to, to find success. Uh, does anybody else uh, have a question and, or uh, an observation and a question for the panel? Yes, please. And stand up, please. please. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. My name is Abdul Waberi. I'm from Somalia. I'm so excited to be here today with you. Uh, to add one more point on what my colleague from Somalia said uh, about uh, expecting uh, the reward or return for the work you're doing, His Holiness himself said, focusing for the minor part of your life will develop a sense of loneliness to yourself. And that shows you, uh, as he himself said, as a response of one of the questions asked by the younger uh, youth leaders, if you spirit love and expect to be loved back, that's selfishness. It shows us that it's not about the work we are doing ourselves, but about, about the generations that we are creating, uh, that we are trying to create a generation for them. And that exactly matches the two old sayings, which says, with patience, ease comes. And the sacrifice we're doing will create possibilities for entire life. So I absolutely uh, uh, can convince my ego and internal conflict now that the work I'm doing is not for my better future, but the future of the generations of the communities I live with and the world communities that I belong to. Uh, and uh, that uh, was a little observation. And I had a question for my uh, two, uh, two fellow youth leaders, which is like, uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama said, uh, it is very important to develop a sense of oneness uh, and that we as a human beings belong to each other no matter which faith, color or region we came from. And exposing that to our practical situation in the world, you will realize that it is the other way around. Uh, because living in the 21st century, uh, you will understand that uh, the world now is focusing on developing uh, weapons uh, and, and chemical weapons. Uh, and that will show you uh, uh, how the future looks like. So as a younger generation, we're expecting to live a better future. How can we trust the future? Uh, uh, how can we uh, uh, trust the future and the politics that are going on in the world that a sense of oneness as a community, as a human being, can be practical in the future we're looking forward? As it's a question. Moran, you want to give it a shot? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you remember when... Uh, Thank you, uh, Wahibi, for the question. But you remember when he said, don't expect anything from the future. As long as you do everything from your heart, that's the most important thing. You are not expecting the results. You just do whatever it takes for the peace. It's your willingness, as you already mentioned, to make a change. The change that you want to make, you may not see it. But the most important thing that you do it not to see the production of it, not to see the result. The most important thing is to do it, no matter how, how and when will it happen, maybe 100 years from now. So just doing it, practice it, that's the most important thing. These are uh, young people with a lot of courage, and uh, when, they, when they look to their responsibility and how they're going to deal with this in the future, but they all are exposed to... Um, things that, that the average human beings are not when it comes to working in areas of conflict and trying to deal with uh, in, instilling resiliency. Trauma, it can be an experience. And Maya, I know you're, you're an authority on dealing with trauma and something called uh, post-traumatic growth. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe you could kind of briefly give us an idea of, of how people can overcome that. Thank you. I don't think I'm um, an authority uh, at all. Um, I think everyone here is probably an authority on uh, on trauma, but um, they are um, these young people are so giving of themselves um, 
that I worry a bit that perhaps they're not engaging in enough self-care. So I do think that there is great value in having the spirit of um, activism and um, devotion to your communities. But I would like, I suppose, to ensure that you do remain here uh, for a long time on this planet, healthy and whole. And so I, I think that the Dalai Lama spoke about um, uh, peace within and as well as peace between people and peace in service to the community. And I, I um, am so grateful for the various tools we've been exploring this week. You know, meditation and mindfulness can offer peace within, that sense of um, anger management and calm, the breath, um, the uh, the wonderful work that the Generation Change uh, group has done on, on sort of understanding and uncovering a sense of purpose. We've also learned a lot about uh, dialogue. I think that dialogue can be so useful for moving from post-traumatic stress to post-traumatic growth. You take um, what has happened, the conflict, um, the trauma, and you find a way uh, to reduce the amount of fear. Even if you can't engage in dialogue with the person with whom you are in conflict, you can have a dialogic mindset. You know, as an example, a minor example, because I don't live in conflict situations like you do, um, but uh, there was a woman who, um, who sort of was stalking me and, and saying unpleasant things about me online. I went to uh, her Facebook page and I saw there that she was kissing her kittens and her grandchildren. And I realized at that moment that she was doing the very best that she knew how to do with the information that she had. And that's, I think, critical for developing that sense of oneness with others. Even though that woman would never, in probably invite me to dinner, uh, nor would I likely uh, you know, go if she did. Um, the point is that my fear was reduced at that moment. There is so much in the work that you've been doing that can help us to reduce fear about the other, to know that, that humanity that exists within them, um, that universal need that we spoke about for um, a wide array of things like family, community, security, love, tenderness, that that exists in the other. And I also think that a big part of what the Generation Change leaders have done that can help with the trauma is they've been engaging in storytelling. They've been using their voices. There's so much that we can do through art, through expression, through our cultural celebration, um, through uh, the joyous reverie um, in sort of human existence. You all have so much to give the world and your stories are going to make a difference and they will heal you as well. As you engage in song, um, you'll find, I think, the feeling of oneness uh, with the world that can give that calm um, and can also celebrate your community. There's, uh, of course, there's, the, <coughs> there's trying to deal with those, those young people and, and trying to help them through these areas of, of trying to bring peace but there's the other side as well. There's kind of the person behind the gun that causes mm. the violence. Um, Jimmy, you, you've done some incredible work with, uh, with examining young people, children even, who uh, become soldiers in war. You've written an incredible book, uh, Innocence Lost, When Child Soldiers Go to War. Can you talk to us a little bit about, I mean, how do you change that? I, mean, I know from covering the military myself that that young men who get involved in that, they kind of, that becomes their identity, is, is, is in some ways their weapon, their, their violence. For children, uh, it, it even starts earlier. How do you deal with that? Well, I really appreciated um, His Holiness saying, to, really two, two things stuck out for me the past two days. Um, one is the recurring theme of education. Mm -hmm. I think um, in terms of talking about transforming behavior, unhealthy behavior, um, particularly with boys and men, toxic mas masculinity, unhealthy masculinity and manhood. I think we see the manifestations of those um, when, when boys become child soldiers. We see the manifestation when uh, it is unsafe for women in refugee and IDP camps. Uh, we see the manifestation when women feel compelled to uh, go through female circumcision or to engage in child marriage. Or as I learned recently from my young sister Wadi, um, breast ironing. And I feel like, you know, education is critical, but 
he did something today which really stood out for me and affirmed me because he said he outed himself as a feminist. And I'm going to out myself now as a feminist man because I think to do human rights work that's sustainable, <coughs> lasting, impactful, um, whether you're a woman, a man, or, or identify elsewhere in the gender identity spectrum, um, you have to be a feminist. You have to believe that regardless of one's gender identity, that we all deserve and demand uh, fair treatment, um, to be treated equally, mm -hmm. to be safe, to realize our visions and hopes for ourselves and our communities, and, and to stand up, to be allies with those who are being victimized or oppressed because of their gender identity. And what I've learned, what I've continued to learn, especially from these dynamic young people, my young brothers and sisters to my left, um, is just the importance of building that community across across lines of gender and race, ethnicity, religion, economic status, as, as my brother Waberry said earlier. And I think that um, we have to have these conversations formally, but also informally. And by that I mean, we have to find the people in our communities. And I was talking with my sister Kessie about this uh, a few nights ago. We have to find the men and boys in our communities who can model a, a different, different um, embodiment of manhood. Mm -hmm. um, we have to show young men and boys that manhood is something that's very individually defined. There's no one archetype we all fit into. Um, some of us, you know, are more feminine, feminine and masculine, or, or we, we contradict the traditional narrative of manhood. And I think that has to be embraced. And we need to, we need to affirm men who do that. Um, and so I think, you know, for the Dalai Lama to say I'm a feminist, for me, was powerful because I was telling someone earlier, we need more men of his stature and iconography to say the same thing and really stand with women as allies. I think we've got uh, some either men of that stature right now or, or seem to be men of that stature in the audience sure. uh, who are youth leaders and women for that matter who, who will be examples. So I'd like to hear from them. Does anyone else, can some of us have a comment or a question for the panel? I know that uh, in when it comes to women's issues that, I'm sorry, please go right ahead. Yeah, it's just an observation and affirmation from, from what I heard from the panel, which is NRP. So maybe my colleague will ask it about the future and our fear of the future, because we as youth leaders, sometimes we get excited and we want like to solve all the problems that are in front of us. And though sometimes we come to a moment when we overburden ourselves and outburn, it feels like we are swimming against the tide till the moment we're gonna like, it's just over us. So I would, maybe for me, I believe that actually word peace can start from within. And when I, when I met, what I mean by inner peace is just like being aware of our emotion, the other people's emotion, and actually be able to give back to them and just don't accept, accept the receiving something. So always in our goals, we should have no expectation of what's going to happen. Just do have a vision, a specific vision, and go through it. And yes, I believe in inner peace. Thank you. One of the tough things, I think, um, in working, I can imagine, in working in your field from, uh, from, t from hearing, you know, the youth, lead youth leaders speak about this and so on, is this idea of, of, of how it, it seems like your goals are so far away from you, so there's, you have to go so far to achieve them. And I'd like to hear from someone in the audience about um, how do you know you're succeeding? I mean, how do you, in, in the work you're doing, um, I, I know that uh, uh, Lula was talking about, one of the, one of the uh, trainers for the program was talking about um, some of the institutionalized uh, wrongs that exist in South Sudan, for example, and how, how hard it is to try to overcome those, uh, for example, child brides, uh, and that's one of her goals. And, and, and I'm wondering, can anyone speak to how you know in, in these hard times when you are succeeding, anyone at all? And please stand and, and uh, give us your name and, and country of origin. Yes. Um, hi again. Um, well, for me, I always say to myself as um, some kind of encouragement, if I was working with like 25 women and I helped one of them, then I'm successful. If each one of us uh, put on effort, like put their passion in whatever they do and help one individual through their lives, and I think that is enough. I mean, sometimes you don't see the results right away, 
but you have to have this like passion inside your soul that okay i'm doing uh, what i can i'm putting effort in what i love and i'm trying to help people and i think that's it you don't have to see the results right away you don't have sometimes to ask yourself if i'm like successful or not because it will put a lot of pressure on your mind and your soul so sometimes we just have like to keep going and see whatever will come to our way thank you thank you very much can I respond to that, yes please i just want to respond quick if i may quickly i thank you so much for saying that i, I agree with you wholeheartedly you know i think among a number of things that His Holiness said over the past several days of our time with Him, one of the things that really resonated deeply for me, and I, I think you really touch upon it with what your, your remarks just now, is the importance of the inner peace, but also recognizing that the change that you all are seeking, that we're all seeking collectively, is a communal effort. I mean, you all are dynamic, individual social entrepreneurs and leaders, uh, visionaries. And as you'll, as, as you'll learn over time, those visions are realized not by yourself individually, but they're realized working with communities, with partners, with allies, with family, with people who will affirm your vision, who will support you when you're tired, when you're drained, when you're depressed. And I think it goes to what Maya was saying earlier, to have those support systems for your own care, but also for the care of your, of your visions and the, the visions you carry from your ancestors. I mean, His, His, His Holiness spoke to the need for education, but also how the Tibetan people have held onto their history for hundreds of years. And I think, you know, carrying our histories, carrying, carrying the hopes of the people who came before us, that's sustaining. And you're, you're part of that continuum. You're, you're carrying those hopes from people, family you never knew, that's inside of you, inside your vision. And may I add also, though, some of your, there is such a thing as historical trauma and cultural trauma, you know, and that has to be addressed as well. When you have a whole community that has been displaced or who has suffered, you know, sometimes it's very hard and you have to revisit um, an understanding of who you are as a people and reframe, chuchi mata, I say, you know, wash the eyes and remind yourselves of your strength and, and your bounty. I, I, I really want to also, you know, speaking to to, to what you were mentioning, um, I think the Dalai Lama also um, really did a good job of, in addition to inner peace, uh, um, and, and in addition to his emphasis on inner peace, the Dalai Lama also, I think, uh, spoke about peace in action. And I think that what distinguishes many of you um, uh, young leaders from, from others is that you really are reframing and rebranding peace as action oriented. So success comes from the little things you do and you have a very multifaceted definition of uh, peace. You know, it's not just one thing. It's not just the absence of conflict. It is about women's rights. It is about negotiation. It's about, um, uh, it is about, um, uh, you know, you know, safety and security and challenging extremism, but it's also uh, about um, uh, cultural uh, survival and it's about gender and much more. And so the idea is that each of you has a part to play, a role uh, and a piece of the puzzle. Um, and the idea, I think, is you find success in making the small changes and it's about peace as lived daily, you know, bit by bit, in the work that you do, in the way that you walk, um, in the person that you are, and in the, um, you know, in the way that you speak, and um, and you can feel successful and whole, even if you are planting seeds under whose trees you may never see. Um, I think just by looking at um, the the work and the actions um, uh, of a, of a given day. Thanks, Maya. That's, that's, that's really helpful. I think there was another hand out here. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Lupai from South Sudan. Uh, I'm trying to go back to the earlier question about how we can measure our success. Yes. You know, there are a couple of activities that we've been doing and um, a lot of things that we sometimes do. And when people start talking about what you're doing, at least that's the measure, that's the kind of uh, sense to say that what you're doing is is having an impact in the community. So most of the times we do engage in peace building activities and they may be stopped by uh, 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 like uh, 
government or maybe uh, other security forces and stuff like that. But then the fact that there's already somebody trying to block what you're doing, to me that's already part of the success story. That means somebody is already noticing what you're doing and however, uh, however negative they take it, it's now your positivity inside you that keeps driving it. So when you organize an event and then uh, people turn up for it, for example, it's a dialogue, people turn up for it, that's a measure of success. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a resistance that, that is coming in from authorities or, or, or other people around, that's one way we measure. That means somebody is already noticing the work you're doing and already you're on the right path. That's a fascinating way of looking at it, that the kind of the, the, the dark mm -hmm. forces are paying attention so you know you, you must be doing something right. Yeah, another, another question here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Suleiman and I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, actually, as we all know, uh, we all, in, in my community, people are suffering lots of challenge and troubles and problems nowadays and even in several years past. Uh, they are losing nowadays their hopes because of the suicide attack, their terror, killing of people, even innocent uh, children there. Uh, but I asked this question and I shared my uh, opinion with His Holiness, but he said one thing very positive thing and shared it with me. Uh, with me. And when I go back home and in my community, I will uh, sure share this one with all my friends and ho all the people who are living around me. Uh, he said that whenever you are in a, in a dark place and when you think that there are doors are closed, but never lose your hope, because maybe an angel come and will help you, and you should be so optimism and optimistic. In this case, I got that message that when we uh, keep our hopes, then we may go further. Mm -hmm. And if we lose our hopes, it's the time that we may uh, end, put an end in our life. So he mentioned that if you keep your hopes and if you remain optimistic, in this case, you you will for sure uh, gain a result and will you uh, for sure reach on the position, on the goal and the core position that you uh, are having in your mind and you are planning on that. In this case, this is a big message for me. Whenever I go back my home, I will for sure share this topic and this issue that we have to be optimistic because of all the uh, bad things happening around us. We should not lose our hopes and our beliefs in peace. One day we'll reach it. And of course, one day we may have a good country and peaceful country. Thank you. That's a terrific way of looking at it. Uh, yes, it was. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I am Nan. Uh, and this is from uh, Myanmar. As uh, you, all, uh, you all know that uh, Myanmar is also one of the, uh, the world's longest uh, civil war and we are living in a traumatized society. So linked to uh, what uh, Maria said and all my friends, I want to address like what uh, His Holiness uh, uh, inspired me. Like uh, he inspired me not, uh, not to dray in the past. So uh, we, ha we had to be present to move on to uh, to be uh, to for working for a, a better future, and like, and we uh, we have to have a genuine compassion. So, and he, I think uh, he's, he is uh, he he used a lot of compassion and wisdom to have uh, to work for. We not only we ha we are having compassion, we also have to have wisdom to have wisdom. So uh, we have to educate people. In education is not um, focusing on a materialistic. Mater materialistic. We have to uh, focus on uh, changing our inner mind uh, to to head to be healthy uh, in in inside. So that's why we combining to uh, wisdom and uh, education, so we, we can move forward and we can cut the the traumatic society and we can forget or we. We, we can have a forgiveness since we, we, may, we might get inner peace. We have to try as a peace builder. Like a, I, I always remind myself what the Buddha said that peace, come, peace comes from within. Do not see it with us. So as a peace builder, if we don't have an inner peace inside ourselves, how can we contribute to, uh, for our society? So it inspires me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so I remember there was one, one comment that the... Uh, uh, Dalai Lama made that I wrote down uh, what struck me was that on the uh, issue of trying to be uh, trying to be a success trying to measure success one simple thing that he said was that um, 
pessimism is a, is a source of defeat, but optimism is a source of success. So there you go. We have another question uh, yeah. or comment. Uh, so my name is Kesi Ekumo. I'm from the Central African Republic. And I just wanted to add a point on how we measure success. Uh, remember that when I start to work on peace building uh, field, I didn't took time like, to think about how I measure my success. And it was really in the, mind, in the same mindset that the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama asked us to be. It's like I was planting my beans, I would say, and I, I don't think about how, how many people are trained <laughs> or how many people are received, like, I don't know, the document during the training or whatever. But then as young peace builder, we also have to deal with like uh, donors, you know, people we work with. And the, the system, the mechanism in which we are involved at the, you know, with the donors put us like to forget about those small things. And so talking about, uh, I mean, the point that the Dalai Lama raised really took me back to the fact that I, have, I also have to go back to the person that I was uh, before at some point, even though I still have, I still need to be, you know, to think about how to report to the donor at some point. But I think so like taking, you know, going back to that kind of um, uh, humility in the way I work in, uh, on the field is important. So for my peers, I would say that maybe more and more we have to think it's not so much about like the number of people you train, the number of people you touch, but it's, more, it's, about, it's about the number of people who stay and come back, even though there's no perdium, even though there's no like uh, big, I mean, even though it's not a big thing, but the number of, of people who go and back uh, to, to the event you organize or to the uh, training you organize. The second thing is like we have to celebrate our small success. By celebrating our, our small su success, I'm thinking about like promoting not just our work but also the work of young people who you know benefit from training that we organize. By you know by uh, promoting the other, I think it will open space. Our peers need role model, and we have an important role to play to develop and promote those role model. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. As he said. One can become 10, 10 can become 100, and, and that's how we move forward. Yes, another, another question. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sherry from Afghanistan. I have a question, and uh, my question refers to Maya. Uh, thanks, Maya, for being and for the great support you provide for peace builders. Uh, we're uh, discussing topics of resolving conflicts and changing behaviors. Uh, since what I do in Afghanistan is very much related to changing behaviors through civic race and extremism, uh, some experts uh, say that uh, the main reason uh, that he, uh, youth are drive to extremism and violence are not the weak economy or uh, insecurity. But this is because they're excluded. This is because they, that uh, youth believe that they're not well represented. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? And how we uh, better include these youth? Thank you. Thank you. I agree wholeheartedly that you know all of re the research that I have explored has indicated that the main reason that people move to extreme positions is they don't have a sense of belonging, they don't have a sense of purpose, a sense of community. That's why programs like yours are so important and the fact that you can inspire other young people to find a sense of leadership and purpose. There's a lot um, of, of work that I've done, for instance, with mediation programs where I put um, the gang leader <coughs> as the mediator um, because it's really about putting someone who wants the attention, who has a, a voice and is probably dynamic and charismatic and changing the way that they see themselves. And I think that a lot of young people who move towards extremism, it's because they haven't been given an opportunity or a vision of themselves that is productive, that is powerful. You know, they haven't been um, told that their actions uh, are a soothing balm and that they can be heroes. And so a, a lot of it is about the, the messaging that, that they're receiving, not just in, in um, uh, religious spaces, but also in educational spaces and in community spaces, I believe that there is a, a wonderful opportunity to recruit youth um, uh, through um, the kind of work that you're doing, championing and embodying. Um, there is a need to, I think, change 
the definition of courage, just like we might change the definition of manhood, right? Courage is not um, uh, holding a gun and running, uh, running into uh, danger. Um, you know, courage is not jumping out of a plane. It's really about taking a long walk down a road where you don't know the destination and you don't necessarily, and you're hungry and you're thirsty, uh, but you don't know where you can rest and you keep going anyway. So I, um, I thank you all for your courage uh, and, uh, and hope that you work with um, other young people to find the same. This is a room that is, I think, I think is bursting with courage and, and we're, we're so privileged as a panel uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Jimmy and Maya and Wadi and Marone, and I want to thank all of you for for participating and for the work you do. Uh, it gives all of us hope, and and that's what we all can hope to rely on moving forward at these these dangerous times. This has been an, a, a stimulating discussion, I think, and and we thank you for watching, and we invite you to continue the discussion at hashtag USIP. Gen change. Thanks very much.